Welcome to another episode of the IFC's Individuation Podcast. I am Dr. Lahab El Samurai, and with me is Dr. Eric Tomlinson and Dr. Lisa Hong. And we together are dipping into the demonic father. We are still working off of uh, Dr. Von Franz's book, uh, Archetypal Symbols in Fairy Tales. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody today. Uh, we have an exciting podcast for you. Um, Eric, Lisa, you want to say something to uh, our audience? Greetings, Space Cadets. Enjoy the Space Cadets here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I apologize <laughs> for the Space Cadet comment. He lives in Florida. That's why. <laughs> I like space. He's, he's, he's near NASA. This is why he, <laughs> he thinks he can make those jokes and other people get them. So if you're not near NASA, that's where Eric is. So yes. he's, he's one flight away from the space shuttle. What? <laughs> that explains how Eric just likes to have fun and go there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, space Thank you Dr. Lisa. <laughs> he speaks like you're his brother in space. At least somebody appreciates me. We appreciate you on our off days, on our good days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we always appreciate you, Eric. Yeah. Eric, take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. <laughs> we always appreciate you. You know, we appreciate you. Thank you, Chief. So today we are back um, into the Demonic Father, which is very interesting because these last four chapters of her book are the Demonic Father, the Great Mother, the Demonic Son. The magical daughter. So um, I think in her next book, she starts to talk about uh, the shadow element of uh, the maternal and the shadow element of the feminine. Anyway, uh, today we're going to get into a fairy tale. Eric is going to read us a fairy tale. And then we're going to talk about thus fairy tale. Um, Eric? Do you want to start us off? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Today I will be reading a fairy tale um, where a secular ruler over life and death is personified as death, as in this Grimm's brother's tale, Godfather Death. Once upon a time, there was an old man who already had 12 children. And when the 13th was born, he did not know where to turn for help. In desperation, he went into the woods. There, the good Lord happened upon him and said to him, I feel sorry for you, poor man. I will lift your child from his baptism and take care of him. He will be happy on earth, the man answered. I do not want you as a godfather, or the man answered rather, I'm sorry. The man answered to the Lord, I do not want you as a godfather. You give to the rich and let the poor starve. With that, he left him standing there and continued on his way. Soon thereafter, death happened upon him and also said to him, I will be godfather for you and pick up your child. And if he has me as a friend, he will lack nothing. I will make a doctor out of him. The man accepted the deal. The next day, death arrived and held the child for his baptism. After he had grown up, death came again and took his godchild into the woods and said to him, now you are to become a doctor. When you are called to attend to a sick person, you must only pay attention to where I'm standing. If I'm standing at his head, without further ado, let him smell from this flask, then anoint his feet with its contents, and he will soon regain his health. But if I'm standing at his feet, then he is finished, for I will soon take him. Do not attempt even to begin a cure. Soon the young man became a famous and rich doctor. He only needed to see a patient, and he could immediately predict whether he would regain his health or die. Once he was summoned to the king who was suffering from a serious illness. When the doctor approached him, he saw death standing at, king, at the king's feet. 
and he knew and knew that his flask would be of no use. But it occurred to him that he might deceive death. Thus he took hold of the king and turned him around so that death was now standing at his head. This trick succeeded, and the king regained his health. After the doctor returned home, death came to him angry and grim-faced, but forgave him only because he is his godfather. Soon afterward, the king's beautiful daughter took ill. The doctor came and saw death standing at her feet. Astonished at her beauty, he forgot the warning, turned her around, let her smell from the healing flask, and anointed the soles of her feet with its contents. Instantly, her cheeks flushed and life stirred afresh in her. On his way home, death grabs the doctor with his ice-cold hand and leads him into an underground cave. There the physician saw how thousands and thousands of candles were burning in endless rows. Some large, other medium-sized, others small. Every instant, some died out and others were relit so that the little flames seemed to leap hither and thither in perpetual change. Look, said death, these are all the living, and here is a light that will burn only a little longer and then go out. This is your life. Take heed. When the doctor sees his own very small light, he is frightened and begs for a, a new life. Death pretended that he was going to fulfill this wish and took hold of a large new candle. But desiring revenge, he purposely made a mistake in relighting it, and the little piece fell down and went out. The physician immediately fell to the ground, and now he himself was in the hands of death. So, Eric, what do you what are your thoughts about the story? Well, um, I think that the overall arching, one of the overall arching themes is the connection that exists between, between life and death. And that's been gone on since the beginning. That's been going on since the beginning of mankind. This is obviously after Christianity existed. Not just that, after Catholicism existed, because this is clearly a Catholic-oriented religion here. They're baptizing them at birth. So it's clearly not Protestant. And Christianity, as a lot of other religions do, as most religions do, continues that theme by trying to connect life and death. And similar to this story, again, I'm more familiar with Christianity, it's doing the same thing. It's connecting life and death, except now it's making kind of like karma from the Far East, the idea of karma, what you do, and you're going to get in the afterlife based, that's going to be based on what you do in this life. And so that's kind of what we see happening to this guy. He's trying to live in between and not really paying attention that there's a death coming and that's one thing that a lot of religions try to avoid is to talk a lot about death and to cause us to be afraid of it as a lot of religions do so to me that's kind of the over art there's a lot of little sub points but that's kind of one of the overarching themes that i saw dr lob so lisa what are your thoughts Well, this is an evil father, right? Do it. I was just more like, well, you can't escape the end. <laughs> yeah, for sure, you can't escape the end. Um, <clears throat> symbolically, it represents um, the archetypal energies of life and death. 
there's two yeah. overriding components. Uh, the archetypal energies, there's a archetype of life and there's an archetype of death. Both of them serve purpose. Mm. Uh, one has to end for one to arise. So there's always one thing. Um, this is part of the balance that the cosmos has created between life and death. This is the yin and yang, as Eric said, and, you know, it's, this is uh, karma, I think, is a different thing. It's different goddess karma is the goddess of making things even. You know, she, would, she would be close to this kind of interaction between life and death. So if you have overriding energies in archetypal patterns coming together, you have one that is promoting um, the continuation and existence of um, the, the people who are ill, uh, because in that case, he, uh, in this case, is intervening in the process. He's intervening in the process of the illness to promote a certain side of the illness. Because uh, both sides of the illness uh, go towards different ends. The illness can take you to death. And then you might be revived at the last minute if you have to go through it. Now, the doctor is somebody who cuts through that, somebody who uh, shortens that process of healing. In shortening the process of healing, you are um, tipping the balance of the universe towards a certain way, which is the archetype of life. What, uh, what we call in psychoanalytic uh, par excellence, uh, eros, life force, energy. We've talked about this over and over again. And then there is tantos, which is the drive towards death and destruction. So there's two drives, there are overarching drives um, from a Freudian context. In Jungian terms, there will be two archetypal patterns. Um, I think they were both kind of talking about the same thing, Freud and Jung in this case. They were talking about the two patterns that make up existence. And in the story, there's a description of the two patterns. One is the godfather to the other. One is the son of the other. So there's this back and forth, but the... Um, the godfather in this case is death. Death always comes. This is kind of an old tale. Death always comes because life is here. As long as there's life, death is around. If there is no life, there is no death. If there is no death, there is no life. These are the two operating forces in the universe. And these two forces are equalizing forces. And as we see now in our environment, as <clears throat> the number of trees and animals and habitats are destroyed, um, the more we uh, face the consequences of those things because we've tipped the balance. We've tipped the balance in nature. Um, and one of these forces is life and death. So we created death and we created our own idea of life. And in nature, this is um, pushing up against something very catastrophic. And we, we can see it in our atmosphere, we can see it in environmentally. So he said, uh, von Franz talks about that the Godfather is to be understood essentially as the spiritual father. Fairy tales generally reflect emerging natural images from the unconscious. We witness in this tale a representation that latently exposes the Lord of fate and a ruler of this world in a form of containing, unifying both light and dark. So the Lord, the Lord of faith is a unifying factor. Just like the yin and yang, they cannot operate without each other. 
We can't spin in opposite directions. There would be no opposite direction. Right? So when we talk about Jungian psychology, we always talk about that the psyche is compensatory. Just like life and death. It compensates. Whatever we're doing too much of, it compensates. It will uh, throw the images out of the unconscious towards you and tell you what you are not doing over and over again until you do it, until you change it. It will just continue to harass you. You will start to see it in, uh, in the environment, the things that you need to do that you haven't been doing. You'll start to see in other people's interactions or reactions to each other. You'll start to see it in the way you perceive um, people's relationships and thinking patterns. It's like it's chasing you around. Right? The same thing that happens between life and death. The specter of death is always chasing life around. Oh, be careful. You might get sick. Well, why are we being careful? Because you might die. So life and death are always chasing each other. This is a normal part of the process. What's abnormal is to think that one is a more valuable than the other. We know this through the earth. The plants have to die to create really fertile soil. We know this. When you take out all the plants, when you kill all the elements that live in the soil, what you have is dead soil. Living things compensate and they take care of each other. They equalize. They create life by death. So if you bury a body in the ground, eventually the pieces of the ground will eat the body, consume it, turn it into fertilizer, and then plants and trees grow from that. We keep interrupting these processes. And the more we interrupt the processes, the more the planet changes. Because it's not just we're putting ourselves in like boxes that can't be opened. or we're sealing ourselves in mausoleums. We are not moving with the planet. So in the story, um, he adopts a child. Thus the adopted child is neither a child of God nor a child of the devil, but rather from the beginning, a child of death from which it receives his magical abilities. Death is portrayed as that mysterious deity in its double aspect, a depiction aptly suited to the whole magic kingdom. He bestows the herb of life and guards the life lights in the dark cave, which evidently he commands as he wishes. The connection between death and life in one and the same figure is widespread before Christianity represented as such in Greek mysteries. We see the figure of death was the carrier of the symbol for the deity of the magic kingdom, begging for reference, reverence of by with contradictory attributes. So the doctor has been given this double insight into the mechanisms of life and death. And because of this insight, he, he feels, he thinks, that he could tip the scales. There's a reason why we have scales, the symbol of the scales. You cannot tip the scales, you have to keep them balanced. When you tip the scales in nature, something bad happens. Eventually, the thing that bad that happens is the doctor dies. It becomes his own life that is taken. So when we march through the world, the specter of death always hangs around. But you cannot be afraid of that which has not happened. Otherwise you create it. it becomes your creation. 
And when it becomes your creation, it also becomes your destruction. Good point. I'm going to make a way out there tangent to what you're saying. Okay. Uh, uh, I see like uh, it's the human instinct to be fearful of uh, an end, a non-existence. And so we try to run from it all the time. And we, and then we attach this um, very, um, I don't know how to say, a very uh, human perception to death and we try to make it a villain, right? Yes. <laughs> and in other, other words, a, another way we do this is we try to control our environment, which is not non-existent, is this humanization of our pets. <laughs> like, like you try to treat them as a, a child or an equal to human existing and consciousness. And, and they are feeling and they're feeling animals, but do not mistake it as they think like us. All the time <laughs> and uh, but we're creating these worlds that are not necessarily true so these illusional worlds that we live in these illusionary worlds that we create are based on our need to um keep going yes and that's why we always are pushing the boundaries of certain things <laughs> Because there is something that is always, we are always searching for immortality because life we know, death is an unknown. But this is where that changes. This is where that changes is through these um, podcasts, we are talking about uh, the two sides. They're two energetic sides. They're just different sides. I like the name of the Godfather where they call him the godfather. Uh, the role of a godfather is a protector, is a, uh, a shelter, is of safety, um, is of assurance. And death is an assurance. It is assured. And he brings you uh, to a close. He is a shelter. In the end, you should not be afraid of him. And he is a godfather. Um, I think it it is something that... Um, not to run from I, yeah, I, don't, I personally haven't thought about death too much um, like well, it's consciousness of our of our space mm -hmm. we're conscious of our childhood because we're children once we're no longer children we're not conscious of our childhood anymore only in story and reminiscing then we become conscious of our adolescence. And as we are conscious in our adolescence, we forget our childhood. We focus on our adolescence. Now, we are young adults. We have forgotten adolescence. We are conscious that we're young adults now. We don't belong in that sphere anymore. Now, we're older adults. Now we've forgotten what it was to be young. As we move through, our consciousness changes over time. It's the acceptance of that change that helps us move forward. The acceptance of death. Not accepting death creates havoc. Or as the young people like to call it, drama. It creates a lot of problems because what happens is psychologically, you can't let go of one thing. Therefore, you cannot move into the other thing. You cannot awaken in a different world if you haven't let go of the past world. And in his case, he tried, you know, he tried to cheat that. And the second time he tried to cheat it, it actually led to his own death. But in science, this is, has become a, an ongoing task of trying to overcome something that the gods created mm. at the cost of themselves. Oh, you're a god. You control this. Oh, I know how, not, how to cheat you, how to change the tables. 
this is the part of grandiosity that kills you. This is the part that kills you because these our forces of the cosmos. These are forces of existence. There is compensation. There's a scale. You can't go one far two direction without the other direction comes bouncing in your face. This is what happens over and over again. This is where you're flying high and everything is going great and suddenly somebody says something and everything falls apart. But in this case with this kid, his godfather is explaining to him that he needs to let go of things, that he needs to understand that death will occur, which he does not seem to learn, which means he cannot get, let go of the idea that he has the power of life. You know, what's unique at a hospital is there's a bunch of babies being born. They're crying and screaming and you can hear them. At the same time, there's wards upstairs that people are crying and moaning and dying. You have a space where life and death exist contained in one space. Generationally, that used to be contained in the home. The older people would die in the home. Therefore, the younger people would see them die. It would be an accepted thing. We don't see death anymore. So death has become an anomaly that we have to fight. We have to take more vitamins. We have to do this. We have to do that because we have to fight death. Death is a natural process. You cannot run away from it. It will happen. But understanding that, respecting that makes you conscious of where you are and what, what, like Lisa, you said. It makes you present. You know, I'm not worried about death. I know it's coming. It's somewhere. I'm just not worried about it. It's that fear of and trying to change constantly. You are messing with the power of the cosmos. You are messing with archetypal energies. And what also happens, you become vulnerable and easily manipulated and driven by things that are not true. They are, you're driven by those other characters in you that are reacting and- The complexes. I mean, yeah, because, because here, just the, the beauty of the king's daughter. This is different. The second, the second time he tried to cheat death was different than the first mm. because the second time, it says he forgot the warning. Ooh. And it says he forgot the warning after he saw the beauty of the king's daughter. And, and it, it just kept him focused in the here and now. So, yeah. Why, I mean, why do we forget the warning? We forget the warning because we're in denial. Right? We forget the warning because I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I don't want to believe it. I, I know what you're telling me. I know it's somewhere, but uh, I saw the king's daughter and therefore you have to excuse it because I saw her, her beauty and we get consumed with what we want. But there's a always consciousness is the overriding issue mm. in these stories. How do you come about consciousness? Where does consciousness come from? And how does consciousness lead to your liberation or to your end? <laughs> and does it necessarily lead to liberation at times? It leads to death. Because then you become conscious that you're dead. And some of these stories and the spirits and the ghosts, they're not conscious that they're dead. Once they're conscious of their death, then they can move forward. And so what you have is these complexes that are stuck in time. And they're screaming out at you. This complex was death. Because you're trying to cheat it all the time, you're going to make a mistake. Because you have one enemy. Self-created, self-projected, a spiritual father. Death indicates the connection to the areas of the synthonic powers 
when he stands at the head where consciousness prevails, when the doctor can use his knowledge to heal. If death stands at the feet, the connection to the earth, then the doctor has no power to heal. It seems that the spirit is subject to this rule. If the human, however, misuses this linking of the spirit, that is, his insight into the nature of the unconscious, for instance, in an arrogant way for selfish purposes, it turns out that this God of death presides over the laws of life and knows no mercy. He extinguishes the light. You know, one thing I was thinking of about this story, Lahab is, is um, and Lisa, is even though it's predominantly about the concept of death, and it's not emphasized very much in the story, but it still comes up in the story, and that's, that's the whole point of rebirth, because there are lights that keep burning, there are lights that go out, and there are lights that get relit. And that relit, those the, the, the relighting of some of those candles that have gone out is, to me, is symbolic of rebirth, a, a new life, whether you believe in reincarnation or living with God as a spirit or your energy just simply changing into another form of energy, there's another life after this one. And so you are energy because in quantum physics, you are particles. Yeah. Subatomic particles. And the number one law of thermodynamics is energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Exactly. That's what you don't need to fear. What you don't need to fear is destruction because death doesn't mean destruction. It's a great point, Laha, because our energy is not going to go out of existence. No. When we die. No. Energy does not go out of existence. So the fear of that which never happens. So we're fearing that which never happens because we are fearing the unknown. We're fearing the unconscious. We are fearing that which gives us power. In this case, the selfish purposes, it turns out, that this God of death presides over the laws of life and knows no mercy. Can you repeat that again? In this case, his insight to the nature of the unconscious, for instance, in an arrogant way for selfish purposes, it turns out that this God of death presides over the laws of life and has no mercy. The doctor tried to cheat the laws of the cosmos. As we know the stories, from the beginning, that men and women were created because of something that the gods did. And they lived in some form of paradise throughout creation myths so far. Mm -hmm. They lived in a paradise. The trees always bore fruit. Uh, Animals were not vicious. Everything lived side by side. People did not eat meat. They ate the fruit of the land and they lived with the animals. They sacrificed the animals to the gods. Then they decided they want to taste the food of the gods. This is where everything goes wrong because of jealousy and envy. I want to be what you are. So they ate of the fruit of the gods. They ate of the food of the gods. And once they ate of the food of the gods, they created a rift with the gods. The gods retaliated by having four seasons, by making them work to plant food by making them work to cover themselves, to need houses or caves, to need clothes. These things were not needed. The weather was moderate. 
and the creation myths. The same thing happens here. The mortal doctor and the spiritual father who is that decides that I know the rules, I'm going to break them. Which has always been a bad idea. As we know with uh, Oppenheimer and when they open Pandora's box in the nuclear arms race or in the creation of the nuclear weapon. Once it's opened, you cannot close that door. You have to deal with the consequences of opening the door. And the consequences have not been good. There's an arms race. We're worried about who has it, who doesn't, who's going to blow us up. Not good. And we do it again and again. And in this case, what this, this doctor does is he tries to do that. So we're looking for balance in the story, in the universe, in our lives. And we're also looking for the ability to let go. In this story, this is about letting go. It's about being able to see death and moving forward. Death has occurred, we move forward. We don't hold on to the person who died. We move forward. This is the eventuality of all of us. We move forward, but moving forward requires a consciousness to move forward. Do you need to say, okay, now, moving forward means that your consciousness that this person died, um, maybe you think to yourself, shit, that person, that person was as old as I was. Have I been living my life to the fullest? It gives you a consciousness of what you're doing and what you're not doing. Death wakes you up to the reality that you have a ticking clock. You exist as this life form for so many years. The right ends. That's what this story is about. This story is about facing our own mortality. The story is about not fearing that which is part of the natural process of existence. It's also about becoming conscious of letting go. A lot of our maladies, a lot of our ailments, a lot of our psychological disorders are about holding on to things that are hurtful to us. Good point. This is what we mean by the complexes. We're holding on to things that are dreadful, destructive, demeaning. What do you think, Lisa? Have I gotten too dark again? <laughs> well, that's what the whole chapter is all about. <laughs> You're right on track. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts, Eric? No, can I tell a fun fact about this? And I didn't yeah, know yeah, until no, I read yeah, sure. the, the idea of the, the number 13, especially in this time period, which Grimm, the Grimm's fairy tales were in the early 1800s. So we're talking, you know, late. We're, we're, we're talking um, 1800 is still kind of middle age like in Europe. Uh, yes, the Renaissance started, but it hadn't really spread throughout the rural area. And are you saying the Europeans are living in the 1500s? Um, in 1800, many of them were. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Just checking. So that's where that quote came from. Ah, oh, you're still in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, but anyway, it came from 
the fact that there are 12, normally there are 12 full moon cycles in a year, mm -hmm. but sometimes there's 13. Mm -hmm. And so the 13th moon cycle, which doesn't happen as often, some cultures view it as good luck as a result. Many cultures view it as bad luck. And in middle-aged Europe, they viewed it predominantly as bad luck. There was even a superstition that if you had 13 people that came to sit down at dinner, the, per the 13th person that sat down would be the first one to die. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if wives came up with that to get their children to hurry up and come down to dinner when they called or not. I don't know, but it probably worked. So I, I thought that was interesting that it was related to the moon. Mm. Once again, well, you create your reality, right? Yeah. It goes back so, to the earth. Yeah. So you create your reality. If you project onto the reality that you believe this is what's going to happen, the 13th person is going to die. The 13th person is going to die. Sorry. You're going to die. Yeah. Because they've created that reality. That, that reality is so strong. It's overriding. It's encompassing. It's it's a it's a holding down reality. It's like it's tearing. It's like everybody believes it. And just in case you forgot it, people remind you. Oh, you're the thirteen person. No, that doesn't look good for for you. And, hey, you're thinking about it, and you're thinking about it, and you're thinking about it, and then a horse buggy runs you over and you die because you're not paying attention to the road. And then they would say, well, that proves the 13th person theory. Yeah. And therefore it perpetuates it. It's like that friend you have that always makes bad decisions. And then they say, I'm the one who always makes bad decisions. And then they continue to make bad <laughs> decisions. They, 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 they manifest it. Self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. Yeah. If I believe that I'm going to fuck up, I'm going to fuck up. Yeah. I'm going to create the path to that. I'm going to create my own reality, basically. I create my mm -hmm. own existence. And if the existence says, you have no power, I have no power, I'm powerless. Right. If you say, I'm not going to heal, you're not going to heal. Mm -hmm. If you say, I'm going to continue to hurt, mm -hmm. you're going to continue to hurt. If you say, I will not move on, you will not move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that simple i think people think that it's complicated and they think that oh my god i have to change everything in my life no you just have to change your belief system your belief system is holding you back from moving forward it's holding you back from understanding that you create your own reality you create you know when we say this i think people uh feel overly responsible, feel like, uh, oh, you put me in charge of this again. But we do that because we live in our own reality. So let's go back a little further. We live there. We have created our own reality. We don't live with everybody else. Everybody else thinks we live with them. But we don't live with everybody else. We live in our heads and most of the day. And we see, Dr. Lahab, this concept, again, in Christianity a lot. Uh, at least I've seen it throughout my years involved in Christianity. And that is people think that because they now believe in God, they don't, they, it takes a, a lot of people do, not, not all. But a significant portion think that now that I believe in God, I don't have to take as much responsibility for myself as I did before, because I can pray to God, he'll, 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 he'll solve the problem for me. Uh, if I don't have what I need, I'll pray to God, he'll give me what I need. And that is not exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you have to, once you applied all of your mind to the problem, all of your strength, all of your wisdom, and all of your spiritual sense once you apply everything that exists in you and then you don't get what then you don't get the right result then call on me but see people jump that and use god as a cosmic bellhop and well, I, I agree with you i think the bible is a great mythological book i mean it's it is the archetypal 
uh, archetypal symbol, uh, symbols and fairy tales. It is everything that we talk about when we talk about fairy tales. These are mythological ideas and stories that we have passed on from generation to generation. So what we are looking at is the same thing. What von Franz and Jung did was basically they used mythological stories and fairy tales to understand people's psychological being. So how we understand people is through their stories. So if you want to know your neighbor or a friend or a lover, all you have to do is listen to their stories. In their stories, they'll tell you everything they believe in the world. They'll tell you what they believe about themselves. They'll tell you what they believe about their friends. It's their stories. We don't understand. We don't know how to interpret stories anymore. We've lost the art. Everybody knew stories. Everybody told stories and say, oh, did it mean this? Did it mean that? There was great debate over stories. Now we just tell stories. It's like, yeah, probably means this. Let's move on. We still tell the stories. We're not looking at the depth of the stories. We're not looking at what is being told to us. And therefore, people have lost their compass in the world. They're lonely. Their experiences are hurtful. They're sad. They're disengaged. We have lost our connection to our stories. Our stories connect us to each other, to our neighbors, to our friends, to the peoples of the world. It's through our stories. And this is what we uh, on this podcast have been trying to relay in all these stories. It's our stories that keep us together. Whether they're Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or Jewish, it doesn't matter. It's, these stories pull us together as people, bring us together to have the idea, to hold the idea that we're not alone. That somehow on this planet, we are not alone. We're part of a religion or a tribe or a mythology or... A, um, a psychology, basically to say we're not alone, we are a group. We believe in certain things, we understand the world in certain ways, and we are um, moved in certain ways. It makes us more human. We have stopped listening to our stories. We have stopped listening to other people's stories. Their stories and our stories are of the same. They connect us. But in terms of von Franz and Carl Jung, they basically held their psychological theories. Carl Jung saw that these fairy tales were the psychology of people. So these fairy tales are basically the psychology of the people that you're dealing with. That does, what that means is, is that people are very sophisticated. Whether in ancient times or today, people are very, very sophisticated in telling stories. We still tell a lot of stories. They're more topical. They're more, what's the word, uh, tied in a bow, put in a box. The depth of it is kind of like wrenched out. So when you see a great story here, these are great stories. These are stories that cultures have passed from generation to generation. In this case, Grimm's fairy tales, there's a, a complete uh, volume of Grimm's fairy tales. They collected fairy tales. They went from place to place and basically asked people to tell them their fairy tales and they would write them down. And that's how Grimm's fairy tales came about. It wasn't like they were authors and they sat there and like scribbled. No, they were collectors. They were collectors of stories. They went from town to town and collected stories. Come, tell us your stories, whatever, whatever. And they would tell them stories of other places. That's how they would get paid. 
and they got free content and, <laughs> and they moved forward. So um, it, it, it's interesting because they preserve something that's vital for us. These myths tell us of who we are, where we came from, and why we move through the world. Why we fight on. But we just forgot to reflect. We forgot that um, a couple of hundred years ago is today. And a couple of hundred years from now is tomorrow. We just think that we're stuck in one time and one place. We're not. The world keeps changing and moving at a very fast rate. We won't be here very soon, next 40, 50 years. After that, who knows? Something else will happen. In this case, this is the fairy tales. We will leave these stories with other people to be told over again. These stories also have a lot of uh, vital information about the way we need to operate in the world with balance. A lot of the stories about balance is how do I have balance? How do I have those things in my life that are required for me to move forward, to live? in a peaceful, understanding, conscious way. It's about consciousness. Consciousness is difficult, people. Just joking. No, consciousness is difficult. Because consciousness requires you to change. You can't just see something and say, oh, I know what that is. No, <laughs> no, you have to change. You have to change your perception. You have to change your idea. You have to change your belief. Consciousness requires change. Consciousness is not like, oh, I see you. I don't want to see you. Just, no, consciousness requires change. Consciousness is transformative. It's power. It's an energy. In itself, consciousness is an energy. Mm -hmm. Like the energies that come from the unconscious, consciousness gives us new energies. We're like, wow, that happened. Oh, that changes everything. Consciousness gives us new energies, a new purpose, a new understanding just like the unconscious, just like when we cross over. In these stories, the person who crosses over, crosses over at night. When they fall asleep, they die. Their spirit runs free. It comes back in the morning. They wake, they're alive again. So life and death exist within the same person at the same time in the same space. These are the stories. These are stories we live by. These are stories we tell. We're trying to pass a message on. Thoughts, Lisa? Want to hear another story? Yes. <laughs> tell us another story, Lisa. Yeah, I'm going to tell you guys another story. <laughs> Uh, this one is called uh, The One-Sided Old Man, and uh, it's, a, it's a fairy tale from Siberia. Once upon a time stood 700 tents, and there lived 700 people. Seven lords ruled them. These seven would go around as guests to their people, but sometimes, uh, but themselves never did anything. The seven were brothers and had seven women, but no children. Only the oldest had one son, who was small. The boy did not go around, but slept all day and night. One day he woke up and saw that the whole tribe had been destroyed in one night. Then he embarked on a long hike to the other people. He found a woman there, but she was hostile to him and attacked him again and again. He was then killed by one of the enemies. Soon after came a one-legged, one-handed, and one-eyed old gray beard. In his hand, he carried an iron rod. He hit the dead with his rod and said, why are you lying there? It's time to get up. Get up and go back. Your father lives and all your brothers are alive again. The dead man woke up and began talking to himself. I must have slept for a long time. But what kind of man was that who told me that my father lives and I should go home? When he looked around, he saw no one. 
That is why he thought he must have been dreaming. Despite what the old man said, he did not return to his home and again was beaten and killed. This happened repeatedly until he beat his opponents so hard that they died. Then the old man reappeared and carried the bones of the hero into a cave. He found himself in a dark place where he heard screams, whistling and singing. People tried to snatch away the sack that the old man was carrying. Straight in front of him, he saw something bright, like a window. By, by this light, he saw that the people were naked, without skin, without covering, and just bare bones. Their teeth grinned in their mouths. The old man walked up to the light. He saw the tent and entered it. Inside was no one but a woman who sat on the hearth. On the other side were two monsters who neither moved nor spoke. Their eyes were very large and lay on top of their heads facing upwards. The old man threw the bag on the floor and said to the woman, here you have firewood, throw it in the fire. That is good what you brought, said the woman. I was already completely without wood. The old woman lit a fire and threw it in threw in the bones from the sack and they all burned to ashes. She took the ashes out, scattered them over the bed and then lay down to sleep on the ashes. After three days, a man was born from the ashes. This man had a terrible fear of the guardian angel animals of the cave, but finally found a way out. He had to marry the old woman at the hearth, however, as a second wife. He took her to his, his first home and asked his first wife and her parents joined him. They did this as they all approached his home. He saw all 700 tents, many people and many reindeer. All were alive again. A short ways away on the road, he saw a one-legged, one-handed, one-eyed old man. The old one ran, ran up to him along with a different person, the one who had killed him three times. He began to beat his murderer and knocked him down. Here he lost all his senses and in a frenzy killed the old one-eyed, one-handed man. Then he went back to the tents, but now all the people and reindeer lay dead. And the two women also died. So they all died and he was alone again after he had killed the one-legged, one-handed and one-eyed old man. So let's think about the symbol. The symbol is of a one-legged, one-handed, one-eyed old man. So one leg, one eye, one hand. So we've talked about this before with the left and right handed. When you are only of one side, that side is all you see the world from. You don't see the world from the other side because the other side is missing. This is why in Jungian psychology, we talk about the shadow and the ego. Without the shadow, the ego thinks it is God. The shadow keeps the ego in check, keeps it from overinflating, keeps it from becoming a God. <clears throat> when we only see something from one side, we tend to make mistakes over and over and over again, because what we're doing is we're only looking at it from one side. So if you, if you have an argument with somebody, for example, and you only see your side, then that person can have nothing to do with you because they're all wrong. But if you only see their side, you dismiss yourself and don't value who you are and your experience. So we call it being one-sided. So this is the, the first thing that pops up. It says that the demonic old man guides the lives of all individuals and entire tribe into the realm of the invisible. The cave where he lives seems to be some sort of kingdom of the dead with clear motifs of the afterlife. The enemy of the hero is another aspect of this one-sided old one. Right? So when we have a hero, we always have the anti-hero. 
who's the hero supposed to fight? Who's the hero supposed to succeed against? There needs to be an anti-hero. So, so this mystery of the old man is at the same time a threatening and helpful figure considered together with the murderer, both a life giver and a life taker. So both a life giver and a death uh, bringer in this case. So these opposites, these sides, give you two sides. His one-sidedness indicates an impairment that also affects other similar mythological figures. As Young points out, Don Fran says, the old man has therefore lost part of his eyesight. That is his insight and enlightenment. To the demonic world of darkness, this handicap is reminiscent of the fate of Osiris, who lost an eye in the sight of a black pig, his wicked brother, Seth. Or again, Wotan, who sacrificed his eye at the spring of Mirma. The good, useful side of the old man finds its dark complement to his wholeness in the murder. Such a manifestation, she says, points psychologically to the need for the liberation of the spirit from matter and the unconscious through the human being. These are aspects of the deep unconscious. And these, symbolically, the answers to our existence are given. From the unconscious, we have buried treasure. In the buried treasure, we see things. We cannot take it out with us. We can remember it. It gives us insight into the world. It gives us life through the understanding and vision of what we have seen and how far that can take us. To see a one-sided person, to see somebody who's the murderer is also to see the one-sided person because they've killed one of their sides. One of their sides is dead, the other is alive. Remember, in our first story, the spiritual father, the godfather, is death. You know, and, um, I think we've talked about this before, we've talked about Meet Joe Black, um, the story of death, um, death comes knocking. <clears throat> what does death want? Death wants to want to know what it is to be alive because death is one-sided. Death only knows death. Life only knows life. So that's how it complements. That's how it holds itself together. Without that. So what happens in the story? Let's look at the story. Once upon a time, there were 700 tents and there lived 700 people. So they were well off. Everybody had a tent. That's the first thing we notice from the story. There were seven lords ruled them. These seven would go around as guests to their people, but themselves never did anything. The seven were brothers and had seven women, but no children. So they're the creators, they're the gods of the place. They have no children, but they have 700 people they rule over. And those are their children. But they're incomplete, they're not one-sided. There's seven brothers, but they have seven women. And they're not complete without woman. They're incomplete, they're one-sided. One, um, only the oldest had one son who was small. Okay, so this is the chosen child. This is the magical child. Um, this is the Jesus-like child. This is the special, this is the God child. The oldest had one son who was small. The boy did not go around, but slept day and night. Slept day and night means he lived in the unconscious. He lived as a God. 
One day he woke up and saw the whole tribe had been destroyed in one night. He then embarked on a long hike to other people. He basically went out to find his way of bringing them back. Only a God could do that. It's the power of the God, right? He wakes up to the world and then he tries to bring all these people back from death. So he was then killed by one of the enemies. Soon after he came, one-legged, one-handed, one-eyed, old, gray beard. In his hand, he carried an iron rod. He hit the dead with his rod and said, why are you lying here? It's time to get up. Get up and go back. Your father's lives, all your brothers are alive again. The dead man woke up and began talking to himself. I must have slept for a long time. He's conscious again. But what kind of man was that who told me that my father lives and I should go home. Now, what he does not do is go home. He needs to go home. When we are given insight, consciousness, through this process, we have to take that. It's not a question of choice. It's an imperative. We have to take, once we know it, once we've been given the information and it's clear, we know it, we play it in our head, we have to act upon it. If we don't act upon it, bad things happen to us. Because we have gotten information from deep within the unconscious. Remember, the psyche is compensatory. It is guiding you because you're one-sided. What does he do all day? He sleeps. He sleeps night and day. What does he do all day? He's completely unconscious. He lives in a dream world. He's one-sided. What happens when he wakes up? He tries to bring them back. Despite what the old man said, he did not return to his home and again was beaten and killed. This happened repeatedly until he beat his opponents so hard that they died and the old man reappeared and carried the bones of the hero into the cave. He kept thinking he was dreaming. He found himself in a dark place. He found himself in hell, right? Why, why do we think of it as hell? We think of it as hell because we are unconscious of it. We've just awoken to the idea that we are not where we thought we were. Can you imagine? This is what death is. It's going from one place where you are completely familiar with everything to another place where you're completely unfamiliar with everything. So yeah, you're going to freak out. Straight in front of him, he saw something bright like a window, but this light, he saw the people were naked, without skin, without coverings, just bare bones. Their teeth grinned in their mouths. The old man was, oh, was always terrifying. <laughs> the old man walked up to the light. He saw a tent and entered it. Inside was no one but a woman who sat on the hearth. On the other side were two monsters who neither moved nor spoke. Two monsters. There's always two. Pairs. Their eyes were very large and lay on top of their heads, facing upwards. The old man threw the bag on the floor and said to the woman, here you have firewood. Throw it into the fire. This is good. What you brought, said the woman, I was already completely without wood. She burns him, he comes back to life. He has to marry her so she could take him back to where he came from. He tells his other family that he is there. So the journey is you awake. You finally need to 
do that thing that you've been told over and over again you need to do. Go home. Why do we need to go home? We need to go home to understand where and who we are. Going home is a process. It's a symbolic act. Going back to our roots is going back inside of ourselves and finding that is which is true within us, finding the gold in dark places, finding the unconscious material that is required to move forward. Going home is putting our feet on the earth. It's not a physical place. It's a psychological state of mind. It's not a physical place. We're going back into that which is where you started from. It's the point of awakening. It's the point when you opened your eyes and said, oh my God, what is that? When you started asking questions about consciousness. When you started asking you questions about your own existence that's where home is it's where the first candle was lit he like the phoenix when she burns his bones arises again she spreads him on the bed she sleeps on him and he arises now he know he is wed to her now he knows he is complete. Now he knows he can go home. He's no longer one-sided. The story is always about being complete, finding your way home, finding that point of consciousness that you owe to the world before it became crap, before it turned into crap. There was a point of time of awakening. There was a point of time of innocence, of delight, of vision, of imagination, of hope. That's home. That's where home is. That's the place we need to go back to all the time. That's the place that gives us inspiration, gives us liberation. That's the place that awakens us to the great gifts that being awake and alive and conscious in this illusion makes sense. Now we make sense. No matter how brief that is, for now we make sense. Everything makes sense. And that's what's fleeting about consciousness. What made sense five minutes ago doesn't make as much because there's a gradual evolution in consciousness. It changes, it expands, and it disappears and changes into something much more unpredictable. It's constantly evolving. Consciousness is not static. Like the unconscious, it's movement in waves. It comes towards you. What you're aware of changes you. And now your perception of what you're aware of has changed. The observe and the observer change each other. That's what consciousness is. It changes you. Eric? Just thinking about this process you've been talking about, it's just so many, myself included, during many years of my life, but so many people, if not most, and I'd probably, hear, I'd probably say most people fight this within themselves. Uh, we're afraid of it. We don't want to go back there. It's painful. They're... Uh, 
yeah, I loved being innocent during that time, but, but being innocent meant that I was extremely vulnerable to that process. And so we fight it a lot. And as a result of fighting it, we, um, we can't learn from it what we are able to learn from it that can propel us forward. Going home forward. is not easy. No, it's not easy at all. It's not easy. Well, it's just like that passage I was talking about a, 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 a little bit earlier. You got to spend all your, actually the four things were heart, mind, soul, and strength. And once I read that, that passage, <clears throat> at times when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm free within myself, whether it's a conflict with a loved one, with a partner, with a sibling, with a friend, with a problem in my finances, whatever it is, my future, have I really spent all, all the energy that I can bring up out of my heart? Have I really spent all the energy that my mind possesses and all the energy that my soul possesses and the strength that I have? Have I really utilized all of that to focus on this subject? And if I haven't, then I've not lived up to my responsibilities. But those responsibilities scare the hell out of you to do that. It's hard to be that open to all of that. So that's what I was thinking about as you were reading that. Ooh. Yeah, it's absolutely the truth and it's absolutely what we need to do. But I found out that I needed help from other people to learn how to do that. Of course, we all need help. The, the, process, the process is not a singular journey, right? No, it isn't. And the, the process requires the collective. You're not going to be complete trying to figure out whatever you're trying to figure out because what it requires is uh, requires other forms of consciousness that you need. You need to have compensatory factors around you. You need friends, you need lovers, you need people to be there for you. You need people to stare at you and say, no, no, that's not, I know you say this, but this is not what you're doing. You need other people to reflect uh, to you what is going on because sometimes we, well, sometimes, most of the time, we live in our own fantasies. And so there's a shared fantasy we have to contribute to. And that's where it becomes complicated. Um, suddenly we realize our fantasy can be self-destructive. Yes. Um, not helpful to our existence. And that's hard, I think, what you're saying. It's hard to come to terms with um, and take responsibility for what, how destructive we've been to ourselves. So we'd like to say to ourselves, um, well, I have no choice. But we do. Right, Lisa? Do we have a choice? Yeah, we have a choice. <laughs> we are Lisa, powerful. <laughs> we, that we have a choice. With that, I'm going <laughs> to call it a day from the IFC's Individuation Podcast. Uh, Dr. Tomlinson, would you like to say uh, anything to our listeners? Thank you. I know this is a dark subject, <clears throat> but we all have elements of it in our lives. It just helps us to think about it, assess it, and get help in understanding it, whoever that is that you trust the most to do that from. And that's what I'd like to encourage you to do and for us three to continue doing it in our own lives. Lisa? Hey, everything's gonna be all right, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As always, we close with our words. We are not afraid. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. Thank you very much for joining us for the IFC's Individuation Podcast. I am Dr. Lahab Al Samurai, and with me was Dr. Eric Tomlinson, and Dr. Lisa Hong, and we will talk to you and see you next week. <laughs>